Good morning, church. I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's Good Friday morning, and we are thankful to the Lord that we're able to preach God's word on this Good Friday. We're able to preach the gospel, the good news. And so it's not ideal. We would much rather prefer to gather together as a church and sing and pray and praise and hear God's word together. But we are thankful that we can make use of technology to hear God's word. And this morning, it's a great privilege for me to be able to preach God's word to you. And that's what I want to do this morning. I want to speak on what we are celebrating on this day. It's Good Friday. And on Good Friday, we celebrate and reflect on the death of Jesus Christ, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And my hope and aim this morning is to have us dwell and reflect on the significance of the crucifixion so that we can see why it is so precious to us. And so this morning, if you have your Bibles with you, please turn with me to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, the Gospel of St. Mark. That's where we'll be at this morning. And we'll be in the 15th chapter of Mark's Gospel. And we'll read from verse 21. It is the account of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ recorded for us in Mark chapter 15. And so in your Bibles, please do follow along as I read Mark chapter 15 from verse 21. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in, the, in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments amongst, among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him, and the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with them they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabatani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders, hearing it, said, Behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you that we're able to open up your word on this day. We give you praise, we give you glory, and we give you all the thanks, oh God, for carrying us through even this difficult time we've had to endure over the last couple of weeks. We do pray now, Lord, that you'd open our hearts and open our minds, and especially open our eyes, that we will see wonderful things in your word. Encourage us, strengthen us, and help us to cherish our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, even more as we reflect on His death and as we reflect on His crucifixion. And so bless us now as we ask you these mercies. For Christ's sake. Amen. Well, this morning on this different yet Good Friday, we celebrate and reflect on the precious death of our beloved Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is Good Friday. And yet I suppose there's a lingering question in our minds this morning that, that, I, that I might sum up in, in this manner. What does the crucifixion of Jesus, the death of Jesus, mean in a, in a COVID-19 pandemic time? Now, I suppose we can think of many answers to such a question. The Bible, I would submit to you, would uh, uh, 
bring up a few answers to such kind to such a kind of question. However, this morning I present you with this answer to just give you context and to just give you a sense of peace as we consider this subject this morning. What does the crucifixion of Jesus, the death of Jesus mean in a COVID-19 pandemic time? Well, brothers and sisters, it confirms for us the need for the cross. You see, the cross of Jesus, the cross of Jesus is God's means of reconciling the world to himself. Not merely sinners, but the redemption and renewal of creation itself. It is God's way of making all things new. In the, word of the, in the words of the hymn writer, He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. The more we see the ruin, the fallen, the troubled and even sick world that we are living in, especially in this COVID-19 pandemic time, the more we ought to appreciate the cross because it reminds us that God is redeeming sinners and their habitation from the effects of the fall. And in the words of the book of Revelation, in the words of what we read there in chapter 21, even extending to chapter 22, he makes all things new. So let's remind ourselves on this Good Friday, the events of the cross of Jesus Christ, what took place at the cross of Jesus Christ. We can be, though we ought not to, we can become very familiar with the crucifixion. We're very familiar with the details or the events of the crucifixion. And it's important this morning that we reflect again on what the Bible teaches about the crucifixion. It's important this morning that we glance and look even more carefully, I should say, at the events recorded for us in the Gospels with regards to the crucifixion. In Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 15, we have a very clear and we have a very helpful uh, summary and account of what took place on that fateful morning, what took place on that good Friday. And this morning, I want to encourage you. This morning, I want to welcome you to consider this with me as we look at Mark chapter 15 from verse 22 through to verse 39. Now, I want to look at the events of the crucifixion and the message this morning is very simply titled The Crucifixion of Jesus Christ because that's what we'll be looking at. And the first point I want us to look at is the arrival of Jesus at the cross. The arrival of Jesus at the cross. And that, of course, is stated for us in verse 21 through to verse 26. We read that a man by the name of Simon of Cyrene was compelled to help Jesus with his cross. And they came to a place called Golgotha where they offered him a wine mixed with myrrh. He didn't take it. Then they crucified him there and divided the garments. And so we see that we have insights here as to what happened when Jesus Christ arrived at the cross. The account of Jesus' crucifixion starts with the announcement that they brought him to Golgotha. It's a hill outside of Jerusalem shaped as a head or a skull, hence the place of a skull. What is of note here is that Jesus stands now at the place he will be crucified. He has arrived now, as it were, at the foot of what will become the cross, at the, at the foot of the cross. He arrives here not only at a place determined by the Roman soldiers, he arrives here at a place not merely determined by the envy of the Jewish leaders, but brothers and sisters, please note, Jesus Christ arrives here by the determined and definite plan and foreknowledge of God. He is where he's at, not against his will, he is where he's at because of his will. This was world for him before the foundations of the earth, that he stands right here at this place on the earth, at the foot of the cross, as it will be. The question we must ask is, what do we learn when we reflect on Jesus' arrival at the cross? Well, firstly, I want to say Jesus is faithful. That's the first thing we learn. We learn that Jesus is 
faithful. Throughout the whole gospel account, since his birth, baptism and public ministry, Jesus had one destination in mind and he was on his way there. He predicted it to the disciples and the Jewish leaders that the Son of Man must go to Jerusalem. On many occasions in the Gospels, we would read these words. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Right there written in the imperative mood, he must go to Jerusalem and he must be killed. He arrives to the place he was moving toward ever since he came to the earth to do what he intended to do from before the foundation of the world. In the words of St. Cyprian of Carthage, for the Son of God didn't refuse to put on human Flesh. There was no reluctancy in Jesus. There was no hesitation in the Son. There was no second thought given by Jesus. But as the old creed of the church reminds us that when it speaks about Jesus' incarnation, that it was for us and our salvation that He came down. It was for us and our salvation that He is standing where He is standing, that He has endured what He has endured, and that has remained faithful as he has remained faithful and that leads me to the second thing we learn when we come to the cross Jesus is not only faithful but Jesus endures Jesus was under immense pain by this time and had endured great suffering already it's captured in verse 21 when a passerby a man by the name of Simon was compelled to help Jesus carry his cross because Jesus was weak at this time, having suffered at this time. He was kept out of sleep, beaten, flogged, and his tired body was forced to carry a massive lump of wood upward. And now he stands at Calvary. They brought him wine mixed with myrrh. It was a drink, I suppose, to, rel to relieve him of the pain or, or some would even say to keep him from passing out so they can inflict more pain he refuses to seek relief from the pain why because the pain was not to be escaped but to be endured he was there not to drink the cup of men cheap relief but to drink the cup of god wrath to save sinners so for the joy set before him he endured. Jesus is faithful. Jesus endures. And then the third thing we learn, of course, is Jesus is crucified. Verse 24, very unceremoniously we read, and they crucified him. And they crucified him. So now he's at the cross. He's tired, exhausted, in pain and suffering. And we read, and they crucified him. The recording of the crucifixion is stated in such terse terms, with such limited words, without any detailed explanation. The horrors of the crucifixion could not be recorded in such detailed explanation because it was so horrific. M many tried and, and many put it down on paper and, and in, many, in many cases you can find a nice and, and, and detailed description of the crucifixion but, but, no, but words cannot do justice to the horror of the crucifixion. Our grammar, our vocabulary could not do justice to such a horrific punishment executed by the Roman government it was horrendous that not even a Roman citizen was subjected to such a vile death it was a death intended to prolong suffering it was a death intended to be torturous it was a death intended to communicate to everybody that would see this public display of brutality that they must not come up against this particular authority this government it was a vile it was a cruel it was a desperately wicked means of executing somebody and yet jesus christ endured this i suppose those living in jesus they understood the horror and the agony of death by crucifixion they understood what it meant and needed very little explanation some might not even want to hear or to read an explanation. This crucifixion for public 
Everybody could see it. Ba Passers by could stop and behold if they had the stomach for it. So to say, the to, 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 to say they crucified someone was enough to jolt your eyes wide open and drop your jaw right to the ground. And Jesus, instead of him, they crucified him. And so we learn Jesus is faithful. Jesus endured. Jesus was crucified. And then and the fourth thing we learn is Jesus is king. So what, what, what Jesus is king. And, and this is indicated when we read verse 25. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The king of the Jews. Pilate probably intended to irritate the Jews and insisted that this inscription of Jesus' offense be put up. King of the Jews, though meant to mock and as a sign of ridicule, was in actual fact true. Jesus is the King of the Jews. He is the one promised to come to sit on the throne of David. But dear friends, before he sits on the throne of David and rules, he must die on the cross for sinners. Before the throne of David comes the cross for sinners. And this is as it was set out by the plan and good purpose of God. And so we see the arrival at the cross. Jesus endures. Jesus is faithful. Jesus is crucified. And Jesus is unmistakably in our eyes before us. King. He's king. And the second point I want to make. The scene around the cross. So now that we've seen what it was like at the arrival of Jesus at the cross. I want us to see the scene around the cross. Who was there and what was it like? The question I want us to ask is, what do we learn when we reflect on the scene around the cross? There are at least four groups of people here at Calvary. And one thing they all have in common in their actions toward Jesus was cold, callous and insulting. Uh, the four groups of people uh, would be the Roman soldiers, the insulting crowd, the Jewish leaders, and the two criminals. Now let's look at these four groups of people. Uh, the first group uh, would be the, the Roman soldiers. Jesus is insulted by the Roman soldiers. We see that in verse 27 when we read, And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Uh, we read that the Roman soldiers there, they were dividing his garments and casting lots for it, deciding what each should take. He was crucified with two criminals by Roman soldiers. Now, they don't mean to do this with any more deliberate intent. It was common to crucify more than one person at a time. However, considering the absolute innocence of Jesus, attested to by earthly courts, Pilate, by the heavenly court, God, and by the internal and natural court, his perfect sinless nature, it is absolutely shocking and insulting that here Jesus is explicitly regarded as nothing but a guilty and vile criminal. That's the way he was treated. We are told this was to fulfill Old Testament scripture. Now there could have been a crucifixion. Now I should say there would have been a crucifixion that morning even if Jesus wasn't crucified. There would have been three people crucified that morning even if Jesus wasn't one of them. Now the question is who would have been the third person? Well, remember, Pilate offered the people a choice, Jesus or Barabbas, the innocent rabbi or the vile murderer. The people chose Barabbas as Jesus made his way up Calvary, carrying his cross as he was thrown down on a wooden beam and nailed tightly to it as he hung there suspended in pain and agony. Brothers and sisters, make no mistake, he was hanging there not as a guilty man, but in the place of of a guilty man. He was hanging there not because he is a sinner. He was hanging there because though innocent, he was hanging there for sinners. Not only does he physically take Barabbas place, but he takes our place. The words of the hymn writer again is so helpful here. Bearing shame, scoffing rude, 
in my place condemned, he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a savior. What a savior. Jesus, though he was insulted by the Roman soldiers and put next to two guilty, vile criminals, he's their substitutionary. He's there in our place. Also, we see the second crowd. Jesus insulted by the crowd as a fraud. He's insulted by the crowd as a fraud. So these are just people passing by, the Roman soldiers, and then another group of people that are just passing by. Verse 29 tells us, and those who passed by derided him. So he was insulted by Roman soldiers and treated as a criminal, and yet he allowed it because he was standing in our place. But he was also being insulted by a crowd who was there as a fraud. They remembered what he said when he said he would, uh, he would, he would uh, build up um, the, the, the temple in three days. And they threw it back at him insultingly. They questioned his truthfulness by mocking his words. Yet he spoke the truth and he was the truth. He was referring to the temple, of course, which is his body that he will raise up again in three days. We can only look at such foolishness and and, and thank God that Jesus remained on the cross. If he comes down, I must go up. If he saves himself, I am lost. If he spared from the cross, I will be judged by God. And so Jesus remains. So Jesus is insulted by the Roman soldiers. He's insulted by the crowd passing by. And Jesus is also insulted by the Jewish leaders as an imposter. We read in verse 31. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. When we read these words of the Jewish leaders, we get a taste of their disgust for Jesus, and it's revealing what they believed Jesus to be. They believed him to be a deceiver and an imposter. That they believed that he was pretending to be someone that he was actually not. The irony, though, is that Jesus was not an imposter pretending to be what he was not, but he was a substitute, taking the place of someone he deserved, that who deserved what he instead was receiving. While the first group called for Jesus to come down from the cross and save himself, the leaders here are calling Jesus to come down from the cross so they can believe. And then the fourth group, we see not only was Jesus insulted by the Roman soldiers, by the crowd passing by, by the Jewish leaders, but also Jesus to add insult to injury, if you would. Jesus is insulted by the criminals as impotent. Verse 32, those who were crucified with him also reviled him. So the scene around the cross was of a people standing there hurling insults at the innocent suffering Jesus. It reminds me again of the hymn, Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. If it wasn't enough that the soldiers mocked him, that the crowd mocked him, that the religious leaders mocked him, now we are told that the criminals mocked him. What humiliation he suffered, what a sacrifice he made, what grace and lowliness he shows for us and for our salvation. And so we've seen the arrival at the cross. We've seen the scene at the cross. And allow me to make my third and final point, the experience on the cross. So up Calvary's hill, we see Jesus arrives. We see the scene around and now finally the experience of the cross. So again, the question we want to ask and consider is, what do we learn when we reflect on the experience of Jesus on the cross? Well, again, firstly, we learn that Jesus suffered. Verse 33, we read, And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Mark tells us that at about noon, darkness fell over the whole land for three hours. Mark doesn't say what caused it, and it doesn't speak about any natural occurrence that caused it, like a buildup of clouds. So we are left to conclude that this was not a natural event. 
where the clouds formed and um, something the weatherman could have predicted. No, it is clear that this was supernatural. Darkness is associated with the judgment of God. And that is exactly what was happening now on the cross. Again, in the words of St. Cyprian of Carthage, at the Lord's cross, the stars are thrown into confusion, the elements are unsettled, the earth shakes, night eclipses the day, the sun withdraws its means and its gaze, that it may not be forced to look on the sin of Israel, yet Christ neither speaks, nor is moved, nor reveals his glory, even in his deadly suffering. Here, Jesus suffers under the judgment of God and the sea around the cross the sitting around the cross the entire set up in terms of the darkness of the day shows us that Jesus is under immense suffering we've seen the betrayment or the betraying judgment of, of, of Judas against Jesus We've seen the, uh, the judgment inflicted upon him by the disciples who ran away. We've seen the judgment inflicted upon him by Pilate who flogged him. We've seen the judgment inflicted upon him by the Roman soldiers. We've seen the merciless judgment of the bloodthirsty Jewish leaders who hurled out and cried out, crucify him. All this has brought us to this place and it's been part of God's work. However, it is as if at this time, as darkness begins to cover the place, it is as if at as this time, God decides to take over completely. Remember the cup of wrath Jesus prayed to be taken away? Well, here it is being tipped over now to be dragged out completely by Jesus. Jesus at this time is contending not merely with human judgment, brothers and sisters, but it is at this time that is exclusively, we may even say, contending with divine judgment. It is at this time that the wrath of God, the seething, damning, bitter for sins and for sinners, stored up since the fall in Genesis chapter 3, wrath of God is being unleashed. And every sinner saved, every person given grace to turn to God, from Adam, to Noah, to Abram, to Moses, to David, Isaiah, Peter, Paul, me, you, the punishment that we deserved, the payment that we owed, the debt that we had, the judgment of our sins is now being poured out without reservation upon Jesus. We do not know exactly how terrible this was. And that's good news, brothers and sisters. We can't and we will never know what this felt like, what this experience was like. And that is good news. We will never know the taste of God's judgment in this damning sense. It is said that only those in hell will know what this is like. But then not even they will know this experience in its entirety. One single sinner in hell for all eternity will not even be able to comprehend the severity of Jesus' judgment on the cross. That sinner is in hell enduring the wrath of God against his sin. Jesus endured the wrath of God for all sinners ever to be saved. That sinner is in hell forever and he knew only fallenness. But Jesus knew glory. Jesus knew heaven and for the Lord of heaven to be enduring the wrath of hell, no one will ever be able to comprehend that. Jesus took the cup and drank it empty. This darkness represents God's judgment and here the first experience we look at of Jesus on the cross is that he suffered divine judgment. Jesus suffered. Also, we see Jesus is separated my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That this judgment and suffering is extended into verse 34 where we see God abandoning Jesus. 
This cry of Jesus ought to be the reality of every sinner. Brothers and sisters, as we are sharing in this glorious grace of salvation, brothers and sisters, as we are drawing near to God on a daily basis and enjoying the rich benefits of His blessing, brothers and sisters, we ought to have been the ones who cried this cry, My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? But Jesus came and he took our place and he cried this cry on our behalf he was forsaken so that God can save us he cried this so that we do not have to he was abandoned so that we won't have to be be abandoned we can hold on to the promise that God will never leave us nor forsake us because on the cross Jesus was forsaken in our place Jesus is separated. Jesus suffers. Jesus is separated. We also learn that Jesus is slandered. Not only separated, not only suffering, but notice here, verse 35, we read, and some of the bystanders hearing it, hearing him cry, uh, say, behold, he's he's calling Elijah. Still slandered. It's like Mark gives us a reminder why Jesus is going through what he's going through. Because people are sinful and need saving. And here we have an example of just how much people need saving. That when the Lord of glory, the Son of God, hangs on the cross in absolute suffering suffering and, and agony, they are still hurling insults and slander at him. We need saving. We can't do this ourselves. We need saving and Jesus comes and he saves us. The cross is a symbol of our salvation that he came to save us by means of suffering and dying in our stead. Jesus suffers. Jesus is separated. Jesus is slandered. And then also, of course, importantly, Jesus dies. The crucifixion, the suffering, It is now almost over. The loss of tissue fluid has reached a critical level. The compressed heart is struggling to pump heavy, thick, sluggish blood into the tissues. The tortured lungs are making a frantic effort to to gasp in small gulps of air. The body of Jesus is now in extremis and he can feel the chill of death creeping through his tissues. His mission of atonement has been completed. Finally, he can allow his body to die. Jesus, verse 37, uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. Jesus dies. There, having completed atonement for our sin, there, having satisfied the wrath of God, there, Having received upon him the judgment for our sins, having us on his mind, there in the stead of ruined sinners, Jesus dies to save us from judgment, from hell, and from an eternity under the wrath and damnation of God. He saves us unto an eternal life of bliss and blessedness in the rich and infinite presence of God Almighty. This is why the final point I'm making is Jesus dies and Jesus saves. This is quite significant. The veil, we are told, separated the holies of, of holies where God's presence dwells from the rest of the sanctuary. Not anyone but the priest under certain conditions and certain times could enter. The staring of the veil signifies that the way into God's presence was opened by the death of his son. God removed the obstacle of sin and judgment that separated us from him. There is now access to God. Friends, there is nothing. Not your past, not your present. Irrespective of what you have done or not done. There is nothing that could separate you from God and block your access to God if you trust in Jesus and turn to God. 
God himself has moved, has removed the obstacles. Nothing you can put there can be an obstacle. Here we see Jesus saves us. And then in conclusion, Jesus is confessed. Verse 39, And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that this is the way he breathed, his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God, the centurion. In a, in a way, we could say that this symbolizes the, 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 the reach of Jesus' death and the reach of this good news that has now been accomplished. The reach of it to a Roman centurion. If this message, this gospel, this work well, was not merely for, for Jews. This work, this gospel was not merely for those there in Israel, the religious. No, this is a work. This is a thing done by God to save all those who would believe. And here we see in the confession of a rugged Roman soldier, we see that this would then spark a message that will go and extend from beyond Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. And here we see a Roman soldier looks at Jesus and he confesses and he says, Surely this man was the Son of God. Consider everything this man had seen done to Jesus and everything he did to Jesus. Now he is overwhelmed and has a moment of conviction. Surely this man was the Son of God. His heart was deeply impressed by Jesus and he was moved by the Spirit to confess right here that Jesus is the Son of God. Friends, there's no better place to confess Jesus than at the foot of the cross. Where must you be this morning when you are deep in your sins? At the foot of the cross. Where must you be when you are overwhelmed by the truth of who you are and what you have done? At the foot of the cross. Where must you be when you are overwhelmed by the truth of who Jesus is and what he has done? At the foot of the cross. And what must you do? You must confess Jesus is Lord and surely he is our Savior. And that he is truly God. Right now, today is the day you must confess Jesus. He has come to earth, died on a cross, to give us faith so that we can also say, Father, forgive me of my sins and give me a new heart to live for you. Allow me to end with this hymn that is so dear to me, especially during Easter time. <clears throat> Up Calvary's mountain, one dreadful morn, walk Christ my Saviour, weary and worn, facing for sinners, death on a cross, that he might save them from endless loss. <coughs> Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying for me. Father, forgive them, thus did he pray, even while his lifeblood flowed fast away, praying for sinners, while in such woe, no one but Jesus ever loved so. Oh, how I love him, Savior and friend, how can my praises ever find end? Through years unnumbered on heaven's shores, my tongue shall praise him forevermore. Blessed Redeemer, Precious Redeemer, seems now I see him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying for me. Let's pray. God, thank you this morning for sending the Lord Jesus Christ to die for our sins. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being faithful and for enduring for suffering and giving up your life under the wrath of God for our sins. Oh, thank you, Spirit of God, for moving our hearts to confess Jesus as Lord and for helping us to cherish, celebrate and give praise to our Savior for all that he has done. Continue to bless your church and continue to call all those whom you have appointed unto eternal life to believe in Jesus. We ask you these mercies 
with his name. Amen.